am Margo Kokera, the museum's public programs manager. And I'm Hillary Chang, the director of individual giving. We are so excited you are all able to join this FSK from your home or wherever you may be today. We, I can see we have so many friends with us, over 580 people registered for the event today, which is incredible. It is. As you might have seen when you registered for today's event, we have created the FSK From Home Giving Challenge. With this challenge, our goal is to raise $5,000, which would cover our public program expenses for the remainder of 2020. Normally, these expenses would have been covered through ticket sales, but nothing about 2020 has been very normal so far. So if you're excited for the program today, if you love history, if you want to help support our work, we hope you'll consider making a donation to our FSK From Home Giving Challenge through the donate button on the bottom of your screen. Money raised will help support the creation of programs just like this one. Thanks again for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the program. Well, thank you, Hillary, and thank you all who have donated or are considering to donate today to our FSK from Home Giving Challenge. We appreciate your ex you exploring this virtual offering of our beloved Francesca Key lecture series. And you are engaging with us at a very special time. On September 9th, the Maryland Historical Society became the Maryland Center for History and Culture. And after 176 years, we are stepping into this new identity that better reflects our mission to provide space for the community to discover and develop a deeper understanding of our nation's history and culture through a Maryland room. Part of our vision at the Maryland Center for History and Culture is to deepen our understanding of the present through dialogue with the past, as well as to provide ongoing scholarship. So today we welcome a 19th century US historian, researcher and writer who also focuses on the past to illuminate the present, Dr. Martha S. Jones. Welcome to our program, Martha. Thanks so much for having me here, Margo. We are privileged to have you here with us this afternoon, and we really thank you so much for joining us virtually. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I wish we were together, but this is the I next know. best thing, so thank you. It is. And we can reach so more of you. I see people in California um, and all over the United States in the chat box currently. So Martha, you started your career as a public interest lawyer in New York City and then found your way to blend your passion for social justice and historical scholarship years later. But at this moment in your career, you are an eminent author whose impactful works focus on race and legal culture. You are the co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians, a public historian who has contributed to several museum exhibitions, various newspapers, media outlets, including film productions with PBS and Netflix, you are on the executive board of the Organization of American Historians and a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University, teaching two seminars right now, I found out. And as you know, that is the shortened version of your professional biography, right? <laughs> uh, it, it is, but that, it, it, that's enough, I think, to yeah. be folks oriented. So well, well deserved. So. Another project, though, that you've taken on is to explore your family's experience with mixed race identity and the women in your family that can be traced back at least two centuries. Um, I also your focus on a few you you're focusing on a few of your female ancestors, some of which were enslaved in your latest book, Vanguard where you start at, off asking how these women in your family in 1920 question whether or not they could vote, and if so, what would they do with their ballots? Yeah, um, 
I didn't tell my editor I was taking that detour. Um, he knows now. Um, but I became self-conscious as I was f finishing the book about um, not knowing enough about my own family. And it kind of sent me down um, a very rich rabbit hole that taught me a lot about how to think and rethink the history of women in the vote from the perspective of African-American women. My grandmother, for example, um, in, toward later in her life was much more um, interested in talking about modern civil rights and voting rights as opposed to the 19th Amendment. Right. And you, um, and, and actually this is so apropos because 2020, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and today you will be sharing this scholarship with us um, about these strong women narrative leading the way to new ideas and developments. So I think we should just get started and I'm going to um, leave the rest up to you. And everyone out there, please use the question and answer function on Crowdcast because we'll be checking them frequently and we'll get to your questions a little bit later. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Margo. Um, and thanks to everybody at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. It's going to take me a little bit of a while to get used to this new name um, for an old institution where um, I have really been um, such a beneficiary um, of everything from your archival holdings um, to the opportunity to bring my students from Johns Hopkins um, to, this, uh, to the center um, and even uh, some contributions to your um, exhibition on, um, on the Civil War. So. Um, Thank you all so much for having me here, um, especially to Margot Capera, but everybody there who's um, made it so easy for me to get here. Um, my theme this afternoon is indeed the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, we're marking 100 years of the 19th Amendment. It's centennial here in 2020. And part of my work has been to um, expand um, and to sharpen um, our historical understanding of the amendment and its consequences, um, and also to help move us, if you will, from history, uh, from myth um, to history. Um, my hope is that um, some of the work that I'll share with you today um, is uh, one contribution to what is a broad um, national reckoning with the past, especially a reckoning with the role that racism has played in shaping our nation. Um, my hope is that through this better understanding about 1920, um, we move forward um, well um, through the very tumultuous um, year that is 2020. Now, if you mentioned to me that you're celebrating the 19th Amendment, um, you might notice that I cringe a little. Um, don't get me wrong, um, I've just finished a book, as Margot said, about the history of black women in the vote. And so I'm as interested as anyone in the anniversary and its significance to the nation's past. And still, I can't quite bring a spirit of celebration to the occasion. I think it might, in a sense, get in the way, get in the way of the story um, that I have to tell. Um, when we appreciate that in 1920 it was an open secret that despite a federal amendment, black women, too many black women would remain disenfranchised, you understand, I think, why the spirit of celebration fits awkwardly with our conversation today. In 1920, members of Congress who promulgated the 19th Amendment, state lawmakers who ratified it, and suffragists themselves all understood that nothing in the amendment's terms would prohibit states from strategically using literacy tests and poll taxes, understanding clauses, and more to keep black women from registering to vote. Nothing in the new amendment promised to curb the intimidation and violence that threatened black women who came out to polling places. Uh, voting rights and voter suppression went hand in hand in 1920. Now, lucky for those of you who um, are enjoying the celebrations of this year, I'm a historian and I don't plan commemorative festivities, um, but I am here 
um, to be part of the conversation and to cut through some of the half truths and the myths um, that surround the 19th Amendment. Um, historians are wary of uh, celebrations. We recognize the ways in which um, uh, whitewashed history, partial truths and more um, are essential um, in some sense to bring us together um, and raise a glass. Um, and at the same time, um, historians know that um, the same celebrations um, elide a great deal that's important for us um, to reckon with. Um, so here I'm going to um, introduce a couple of myths, um, contribute some of the history of African American women in the vote um, to our shared understandings, um, and I hope move us toward that grand celebration. Um, the promise of voting rights for all in the U.S. still remains on the horizon, um, and it is our work to get ourselves there. So let's look at two myths. Um, the first is the one that goes something like, in 1920 with the 19th Amendment, American women won the right to vote. Um, you might even hear people say something a little more emphatic, which is that the 19th Amendment um, guaranteed to American women the right to vote. We'll return to that. Um, and at the same time, there's a second myth that I think almost is uh, 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 runs contrary to the first. And that is um, the view that no black American women gained the vote in 1920, that racism kept black American women from the polls even after the federal amendment. Um, so here we are, um, and I thought we'd start, if I could, with a closer look at the amendment itself. Um, the language of the amendment um, ratified in August of 1920 after review by 36 states, it read like this. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So what precisely did that mean for American women? Now, laws that reserved the ballot for men violated the Constitution. Laws on the state level that reserve voting rights with the use of language like male were no longer enforceable. And still, the 19th Amendment, as I hope you've heard, didn't promise the vote to any American woman. Laws, state laws, still kept women from the polls based upon age, citizenship, residency, mental competence. Um, American women in 1920 who married non-US citizen husbands would be naturalized, losing their citizenship and their access to the ballot. So women who showed up to register in the fall of 1920 still confronted many hurdles, even if sex wasn't one of them. Now there was one additional barrier and an important one to women's votes, even after the federal amendment, and that was racism. Now it was true that the 15th amendment in 1870 had expressly forbid states from denying the vote because of race. But by 1920, Lawmakers in the South and the West had set in place hurdles that, while silent about race, had the net effect of disenfranchising Black Americans. Poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses had effectively kept many Black men from casting their ballots since the 1890s. Unchecked intimidation and the threat of lynching sealed the deal. Local voting officials effectively constructed a color line without ever invoking race. So did American women win the vote in 1920? Not all women. African-American women in too many states became mere equals, if you will, to their fathers and husbands. State laws disenfranchised them in an end run around the spirits of the 15th and the 19th Amendments. Registration numbers, as best we can recover them, reflected the effects of discriminatory laws in the fall of 1920, black women presented themselves to voting officials, but many found the books closed. Um, one example from uh, Kent County, Delaware, there um, black women turned out in unusually large numbers. Um, they were organized and ready for the opportunities that the fall of 1920 seemed to promise. But 
local officials used constitutional tests to, uh, to defeat uh, black women registrants. What does that mean? Um, that black women, for example, were presented um, with the text of the US Constitution, uh, called upon to read it aloud um, for officials to prove their literacy. And if they went on, if, then they went on um, and were required, some of them, to then interpret perhaps some of the most complex clauses of the Constitution. Um, these were the scenes repeated again and again on um, those registration days in fall of 1920, black women presenting themselves, meeting with reluctant, recalcitrant registration officials, um, doing their best to overcome the hurdles. At the same time, by that fall, across the country were African-American women who were already seasoned voters. Um, on the state level, in places like California in 1911, Illinois in 1913, in New York in 1917, state lawmakers had extended voting rights to women. And this meant that by 1920, there were black women who were experienced voters. Um, and with the federal amendment, even more managed to cast ballots in that fall. Um, black women um, did vote, though not all of them. How did they manage this? Um, one example comes from the city of St. Louis in Missouri, where black women organized under the auspices of the city's Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA. They set up a suffrage school to prepare one another to register. They even attracted some men who thought they would try again to get on the voting rolls. They taught one another how to pay poll taxes, to pass literacy tests, how to conduct themselves in the face of begrudging officials. And in St. Louis, black women turned out. Newspapers reported that nearly every woman in the city, black and white, registered in that season, black women would come to make up somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the registered voters, the new registered voters in 1920. What was at stake? It was more for black women than the personal satisfaction of uh, fulfilling this constitutional promise. Um, it was more than um, even becoming part of the political machine. Um, African-American women in St. Louis knew that in their city, um, city officials were using uh, ballot initiatives um, to set in place the terms of increasingly strict housing discrimination, housing segregation in St. Louis. Black women come to the polls, they register and turn out in that city in a deliberate effort to contribute to the defeat of Jim Crow. Our second example comes from Daytona, Florida, and there, um, educator, um, suffragist, and club movement organizer Mary McLeod Bethune was traveling the state between 1919 and 1920 to encourage Black women to register. She and all Black voting rights activists in those years, um, she was confronted by brutal violence, opposition that plagued those Black Americans um, who organized but also those who turned out to register. Under the threat of violence, Black women did manage to join the voter rolls, but the intimidation continued. On election eve of 1920, in Mrs. Bethune's home city of Daytona, the white-robed riders of the Ku Klux Klan uh, arrived in downtown of the city of Daytona, um, they were on horseback in full regalia. They had burnt a cross in the river before assembling. And they marched out of downtown and into the African-American community in Daytona onto the grounds of Mrs. Mrs. Bethune's uh, industrial school for African-American girls, today the campus of Bethune-Cookman University. They were there to intimidate her 
They were there to intimidate her faculty. They were there to intimidate the black women of Daytona who had managed to get themselves onto the voter rolls. Now that year, the Klan did not wholly succeed. And the next morning, Mrs. Bethune, her faculty, and scores of black women from Daytona would show up at the polls. And they did so in numbers, deliberately, with the view that coming out by in numbers would somewhat, and to an important degree, shield them from the violence that the threat the Klan had threatened. Um, they cast their ballots that year, but by 1922, when the Klan again assembled and marched onto the campus of Mrs. Bethune's campus, um, it was. Um, a real defeat for African American voting rights. The rampant violence went unchecked. Nothing in the 15th or the 19th Amendment um, was available to curb that violence. And Mrs. Bethune would go on to make a career, um, a political career, not out of voting rights, not out of casting ballots, not out of holding public office, um, but out of lobbying and patronage and political appointment, um, this was her end run around disenfranchisement. So here, um, African-American women are in the fall of 1920. As I said, it's no secret, but that many, many, many of them are going to be deliberately and effectively disenfranchised um, in that year, despite the 19th Amendment. Um, and the women of the National Association of Colored Women are among those who organize to develop now a new strategy and indeed a new movement for voting rights, one that is going to be launched there in 1920. At the helm of the National Association of Colored Women um, was Hallie Quinn Brown. Hallie Quinn Brown um, had been an educator, an elocutionist, um, a club leader, and a woman who had led the suffrage department of the National Association of Colored Women along the years that led to ratification of the 19th Amendment. She is the president in 1920 of the National Association of Colored Women and at the helm of an organization that brings together more than 300,000 African-American women um, from across the country who are now faced with the question, how will we go forward in the face of the disappointments of the 19th Amendment, the shortcomings of the 19th Amendment? And one of the strategies, one of the principal objectives um, of this new movement is now to win federal legislation that is lawmaking out of Congress that would give teeth to the 15th Amendment, teeth to the 19th Amendment, um, to give Black women a toehold such that they could defeat by law um, the Jim Crow strictures that are continuing to keep them from the polls. Hallie Quinn Brown um, reaches out to the National Women's Party. Um, she is a qualified admirer of those women um, who had um, deployed radical tactics in order to press forward and secure ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, she writes to Alice Paul, head of the National Women's Party, um, in part um, because there are celebrations still to be had and Hallie Quinn wants to be sure that Black women are included um, in the celebrations of the 19th Amendment's ratification. And indeed, a contingent from the National Association of Colored Women will be there, for example, when Alice Paul and her compatriots unveil a modest uh, uh, but powerful monument um, to early suffragists, Susan Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott. Um, their marble likenesses are unveiled um, in the, in the uh, uh, Capitol Rotunda in Washington, and Hallie Quinn Brown and a contingent from the NACW are present and part of that pageant. At the same time, Hallie Quinn Brown is working behind the scenes, um, looking to win Alice Paul's alliance in this new phase of the movement for women's votes. 
Um, she will call on Alice Paul along with a contingent of leaders from the NACW and their appeal to Alice Paul will be straightforward. Let's continue this work um, along the road to women's voting rights. Let's work together to secure federal legislation um, that will guarantee to all American women, including black American women, access to the ballots. Um, and while their words aren't recorded, um, we do know that um, that winter, Alice Paul will convene the last of the conventions of the National Women's Party. The organization will fold and Paul herself will move on to a new cause, um, that of winning an Equal Rights Amendment for American women. Um, and as some of you certainly know, um, that is an amendment that continues to be um, live um, and moving forward, it seems, even here in 2020. But African-American women, Hallie Quinn Brown, the National Association of Colored Women and more, African-American women are left, if you will, to craft um, a new movement for women's voting rights. This they will do in partnership with African-American men, and they will work toward what will be in 1965 a Voting Rights Act out of Congress. There are many facets to this movement. Um, the first is that of Black women continuing to work the ground game in each election cycle to increase their presence and their power at the polls. Um, no city more exemplifies this than that of Chicago, home to the great anti-lynching advocate and suffragist Ida B. Wells. There, Black women are not only registered to vote, they've been voting um, for nearly a decade. Um, they are learning to become a part of the Republican Party machine. Uh, they are looking to leverage the influence of their votes um, in local and state elections, as well as in national contests. And remarkably, by 1928, Black women in Chicago will be essential to sending the first Black representative back to Congress since 1901. They push Oscar de Priest of Chicago um, over, over the top, if you will, and de Priest will represent um, uh, them now um, in Congress um, beginning in 1929. So this ground game and learning how to leverage votes at the local level, the state level, um, and influence the outcome of elections is part of how black women continue the struggle after 1920. In addition, um, black women are very much a part of the legal campaign that is waged principally under the auspices of the NAACP. Here, chipping away at Jim Crow laws, um, grandfather clauses, um, uh, whites only primaries, and eventually the poll tax. Um, in addition to lobbying for that federal legislation, um, black women will be part of the leadership and the legal team of the NAACP um, in a second um, column, if you will, that is taking on the question and the aspirations of, for voting rights. And then finally, of course, are the um, important um, essential grassroots organizing efforts um, that will ultimately force the hand of Congress and of President Johnson in 1965 to uh, make the Voting Rights Act law. Um, black women like Diane Nash and Fannie Lou Hamer, um, Septima Clark, Ella Baker, um, these are women um, who are strategists organizers, activists who work in conjunction with hundreds and thousands of black men and women across the American South um, to challenge the Jim Crow regime, um, to make their claims on American democracy, including the claim for voting rights, um, and will with extraordinary courage and under um, life-threatening conditions um, work to make 
the call and the insistence on voting rights for black Americans, the insistence on that federal legislation that gives teeth to the constitutional amendments. Um, it is those activists on the ground that force the hand of Congress and force the hand of Lyndon Johnson um, and bring about in 1965 um, a federal voting rights act. This is a story um, that um, in many ways challenges um, our conventions around marking the 19th Amendment. Um, and that is to say, um, while the ratification of the 19th Amendment is surely a landmark moment, um, it is not um, the culmination of the story of American voting rights, especially when told from the perspective of African American women. Um, it is in a landmark um, that culminates um, in the winning of the Voting Rights Act 45 years later. And still, many American women do not have the unqualified right to vote, even today in 2020. As was true in 1920, um, seemingly arbitrary matters like where a woman lives, a fact that oftentimes correlates to her race, where a woman lives still may keep her from the polls. Um, while we no longer confront literacy tests or understanding clauses, today's voter suppression efforts come in the form of voter ID laws, shuttered polling places, the purging of voter rolls, exact match requirements. These are all 21st century voter suppression instruments that continue to keep many Americans, including women of color, from voting. The policies of voting officials, you'll remember how in 1920 officials in the state of Florida, as well as federal officials, were hands off when Klan violence ran rampant through that state, resulting in the deprivation of black voting, uh, the exercise of black voting rights um, in that state. Um, I think here we sitting in 2020, we are all watching and wondering, frankly, how our officials will, or if they will get straight, how it is that each of us will vote by what terms, by what methods, when and more, by paper, in person. Um, We're still fumbling in many jurisdictions over that question. And we see um, both the possibility um, of the role for state and federal officials in giving teeth to those amendments. We also see the ways in which those amendments um, are um, in essence um, left to stand for themselves, impotent without the strong intervention of public officials. Um, there is much that is um, different a um, hundred years after 1920 and ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, and still, I want to offer you up this story in part as more than myth. Um, instead, I want to offer it to you as history and a cautionary tale um, for our own time. Now, much has changed since 1920. Um, and here, um, when I say that, what I mean to underscore is that in 1920, the prospect that African-American women might become an influential constituency on election day, the prospect that black women might appear on our ballots on election day, the prospect that an African-American woman would be elected to high office on election day for many, many Americans in 1920, those notions were nearly unthinkable. Um, and this then requires the kind of voter suppression that follows on the heels of the 19th Amendment. Today, it's fair to say, I think whatever your political um, leanings might be, um, none of us can deny 
how African American women have emerged um, as a force in American politics, and that is the change. Let's look at a few examples briefly. We could point back to, for example, the 2017 uh, special uh, Senate election in the state of Alabama. There, in a close contest, um, African American women worked not unlike they had in 1920, playing the ground game in a special election, making sure that they were educated on the candidates and the issues, um, making certain that they um, got to the polls, cast those ballots, and that those ballots were counted. Um, in Alabama in 2017, 98% of Black women voters cast their ballots for the Democratic candidate, Doug Jones, um, sending him to the Senate, flipping that Senate seat from red to blue um, in sure evidence of the ways in which African-American women um, have become a force to be regarded and to be contended with um, in even an important contest like that of a special election um, to the U.S. Senate. Let's look ahead to November um, when we, um, some of you perhaps have already cast your ballots. Um, I'm waiting for mine um, in the mail here in Maryland. Um, but as we cast our ballots collectively, um, we will have considered more than 120 African-American women candidates who are running for Congress in this November's election. This is a record shattering number of African-American women candidates. The high bar had been set in 2016 when 48 black women ran for Congress. Um, today, more than 120 black women telling us about how in addition to holding local and state positions, African-American women have their eyes, have set their sights, are aiming for influence, increasing influence in Washington. Now, no one on this call, I suspect, has missed the story of California's uh, Senator uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, Senator Harris, um, in August, accepted the Democratic Party's nomination um, as their vice presidential candidate. And maybe some of you, and if you haven't, I recommend it to you on YouTube um, where you can find it in its entirety. Um, and during her acceptance speech in August of 2020, Senator Harris um, told us many things about herself, including about the women on whose shoulders she stands, as she put it. First, she spoke about her own mother. Um, whose career, um, whose rearing and more um, set Senator Harris's sights high um, as a citizen, um, as a public and professional woman. Um, she paid a moving tribute to her own mother in this regard. And then she named checked six, she named checked six women, um, six women from the annals of African American women's politics. Um, women whose um, work I chronicle in my book, Vanguard, and some of whom we've heard a little bit about even this afternoon. Let me, um, let me tell you just a little bit about who they were. Um, the first was Mary Church Terrell. Uh, Mary Church Terrell was an educator, an education rights advocate, an anti-lynching spokesperson, and the very first president of the National Association of Colored Women. Mary Church Terrell um, was as close to a radical suffragist as African-American women came um, in the years leading up to the 19th Amendment. While she made her home in the NACW, she always maintained important ties and alliances with the women of the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Party. She's one of the few Black American women 
who participated in some of those organizations' most radical um, interventions as they worked toward the 19th Amendment. She was there in 1913 when Alice Paul organized a parade um, looking to upstage President Wilson's inauguration and draw attention with a dramatic gathering um, on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington in early March of 19. Uh, 13. Um, Terrell was also there um, for some of the picketing that went on in 1917 and 1918 at the White House. Um, this um, was essential work that put direct pressure on President Wilson to bring his party on board, to bring Congress on board, and to force a 19th Amendment out of Congress and out to the uh, individual states for ratification. Mary Church Terrell turned up there as well. Um, this is part of the political tradition um, out of which Kamala Harris has emerged. Ida B. Wells, um, who I've mentioned, was also on Senator Harris's shortlist. Um, journalist, anti-lynching advocate, suffragist and more, based in Chicago, um, Ida B. Wells, who's, um, I don't know whether her pen was sharper than her tongue, um, but she was a woman who defined the political sites, the political ambitions, the political insistences of African American women, um, and traveled not only this country, um, but traveled um, Europe and the United Kingdom, all in the effort to make the case for black women's capacities for citizenship, um, Ida Wells, um, also part of Kamala Harris's um, uh, uh, six um, foremothers. Mary McLeod Bethune, I've mentioned um, the great educator, suffragist, club leader, um, wages um, an extraordinary battle in the state of uh, Florida for black women's votes. We'll go on um, to Washington um, to use lobbying and patronage. She becomes part of President Roosevelt's Black Cabinet, helps him to found that body, and will even be present in 1945 when the United Nations is founded. There, Bethune recognizes that the struggles of Black American women against Jim Crow for full citizenship as well um, resonate with women of color across the globe who are facing the scourges of colonialism and discrimination and disfranchisement um, in their own countries. Kamala Harris invokes both Diane Nash and Fannie Lou Hamer, two of the great sheroes, great sheroes of the modern civil rights era. Diane Nash, the consummate, consummate strategist, um, someone who, uh, was behind the scenes, for example, in Selma, Alabama, during that campaign as it um, faced disappointments, violence, and more, um, but also as it forced the hand of Congress and Lyndon Johnson to give up a Voting Rights Act in 1965. Diane Nash, who is not someone whose face we often associate with that scene, was the woman behind the scenes organizing, supporting, and making sure that the marchers in Selma were able to see through um, and see to the end their objectives. Fannie Lou Hamer is a peer to Diane Nash, um, a native of Mississippi, a former sharecropper, an organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and a woman who understood um, politics um, in a very late 20th century sense. She understood the camera, including the television camera, and the power of her capacity to win the attention of the camera and bring the voting rights struggle into the living rooms of Americans across the nation. Fannie Lou Hamer, is the leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964 and will appear on the floor before the Credentials Committee of the Democratic National Committee that year to decry and look to unseat the Mississippi delegation 
which had been selected without the consultation, without the input, without the votes of Black Mississippians. Hamer says time is up, Democratic Party. Um, no legitimate delegation um, can be seated without the consent of Black Americans. And while she fails, she does so um, only after having made this claim, asserted this position for national television cameras, again, pushing Congress, pushing Lyndon Johnson toward a Voting Rights Act. Number six, and the last on this illustrious list was Constance Baker Motley. Now, Kamala Harris and Constance Baker Motley share um, a profession, um, both members of um, the Guild of uh, Lawyers. Um, Constance Baker Motley was part of that NAACP legal team that litigated voting rights um, along with the desegregation of public education and more. Um, she goes on, uh, Constance Baker Motley, to hold public office in New York State, first in New York City, then in the New York State Legislature. And finally, she will be appointed um, to the federal bench and spend um, the balance of her remarkable career um, protecting um, and, uh, and um, the terms of the um, US Constitution, including the 15th and 19th Amendments. Um, this is the six um, women out of um, whom uh, the tradition of Kamala Harris um, emerges. Notably for our conversation, this is not a litany of, um, or a pantheon that includes figures like Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Susan B. Anthony or Lucretia Mott. And this is um, the contribution, I hope, of Vanguard. Um, it is to help us um, recognize um, these new um, figures in the history of voting rights, new to some of us, old to others of us, but to fold them into our national narrative um, here as we have the opportunity to reflect in 2020. Um, the last thing I'll say is just briefly um, the few lessons I think we can draw from the women of Vanguard. Um, the first is that lesson about politics as a ground game. Um, African-American women, um, though they face the threat of disfranchisement, though many of them face the fact of being unable to vote, they never give up on the ground game of American politics. And that means in every election cycle, mustering your resources, um, organizing your people, doing your voter education and more, um, that has not changed in a hundred years. Um, we're still charged as Americans with um, doing politics um, in the trenches um, and in the ground game. At the same time, the women of Vanguard always, always hold the bar high. While they um, welcome the small victories, they never accept them as the end of the struggle. And the women I write about are alone um, for much of our past in insisting that neither race nor sex should have any role in arbitrating political power, in determining who can vote, um, in determining who can hold office. African American women make that argument in 1820. They make that argument today in 2020. Um, and they teach us that while we must get in the trenches and get to the polls and more, we also must establish the high ground, um, the high bar in American politics, speak to those ideals and continue to insist upon them as well. The last piece is about politics as a long game. Many of the women who I've invoked today, like Mary Church Terrell and Mary McLeod Bethune, do not live long enough lives, though they do live long lives, they are not lives long enough to see the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And the women I write about are deeply self-conscious that their struggle is a multi-generational struggle, that their struggle is one that um, will be passed down um, from generation to generation. 
Um, the other night, um, I was at the National Civil Rights Museum um, in Memphis, Tennessee, and there um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Noelle Trent, um, posed a question to me that had been posed to her, um, and it was, what kind of ancestor uh, will you be? And it was a moving question to me that really um, made plain that our vantage on any election cycle um, on the problem of voter suppression and a great deal more, our vantage point on that cannot merely be the vantage point of our own moment and our own generation. It must be in the tradition of the vanguard, a vantage point on ourselves, yes, on our daughters, on our granddaughters and on the generations to come. Um, so I'll leave you with that question. Um, what sort of ancestor um, will you be? Um, and I look forward to um, our conversation um, and questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Conversation and discussion. Um, as many guests mentioned in the chat, this is history that has not been widely taught and it's so important. So that was a real treat to listen to and Vanguard has risen to the top of my must read list. So thank you. Uh, we'd like to open this time now for questions. Um, while you are all writing in your questions using the ask a question button on the bottom of your screen, I wanted to give a quick update on our FSK from home giving challenge. Because of your incredible participation and show of support, we have already raised over $2,500 towards our goal, which is really incredible. Thank you so much to those who have donated, whether that was donating a previously purchased ticket or making a new contribution at registration or even during the event today. I saw those come in. Thank you so much. You are all of the real stars. Um, so again, I'll, I'll shamelessly ask if you haven't already, I hope you'll join your fellow program participants by making a donation today. Any donation helps from $1 and up. It really does make a difference and it will go towards creating programs just like this. With that, I'll give a final say of thanks to you all for joining us and to Dr. Jones for her presentation and I'll let Margo take it away. Thank you, Hillary. And wow, um, that is a very powerful question to end with. And that is in the chat as well, many comments. It is really something to think about. Um, so with that being said, I there are lots of questions in the chat, Martha, for you. Um, let's see where to start. First, I, there are a lot of comments out there about providing resources, um, supplemental resources to this discussion. And that's absolutely, we will take care of that for you. There'll be a, a follow-up email um, in the coming weeks with a recording of this video, and we will certainly um, collaborate with uh, Martha Jones to get some of that information to you. So no worries on that front. So, okay. The first question I'm going to ask comes from Ryan, and they're at, they asked that what type of support did men give the women considering during the era women were to be quiet? Mm. So thank you for that. Um, you know, Vanguard covers um, 200 years of um, African-American women's struggles around political rights. And the early chapters are very much characterized by struggles between um, African American African American men and women um, in spaces like um, political conventions and anti-slavery societies and more. Um, and there's no question, but that the women in this book, um, for many decades, bear the burden of um, educating men about um, the uh, the stakes and the um, consequences of sexism, um, but. Over the course of this story, um, we discover important alliances between African American men and women, and there's no question but that the um, the companion disenfranchisement 
right, becomes a meeting place for Black men and women. By the time Black women are pushing hard on the campaign for the 19th Amendment, Black men have been disenfranchised for um, more than a decade. Um, and while Black women look to them to understand what may be their fate, even after a 19th Amendment, Black men come to see Black women as allies in the overall effort to challenge Jim Crow and to defeat um, those. So the, the great um, Black intellectual and activist W.E. B. Du Bois, who in these years is the editor of um, their magazine, The Crisis, opens up The Crisis um, on more than one occasion um, to um, roiling forums around women's suffrage. And there we will meet um, black men and women who have questions about whether or not voting rights is the way to go. Um, but women, the black women I write about also find important allies um, in men and um, voting rights um, and the deprivation of voting rights is one of their common ground. Was the executive branch a major supporter of the women, meaning mainly the wife of the president? Ryan is asking this question, and there was some comments about that. Do you have something to say about that, Martha? Sure. Um, you know, uh, I think it's a great question, um, and we know that um, by 1913, um, Woodrow Wilson um, who is, has not yet become a supporter of women's votes, who will resist um, using his influence to endorse a federal amendment for women's rights. Wilson's view is that it should be left to the individual states, um, is, a, um, is a very um, specific target um, for suffragists. Um, and it will, um, the campaign and the radicalization of the suffrage movement overall is very much geared toward um, pressing Wilson to come on board, which he will. Um, but it's important, I think, to um, recognize that um, in addition to this, um, uh, African American women have long been targeting Wilson, um, not on the vote, but to win um, anti lynching legislation. Um, and they see um, the president as um, a sure adversary um, in that. It is Wilson who will um, uh, segregate um, federal employment, um, who will um, set to the side um, African-American office holders um, in the federal government. Um, and so both suffragists and civil rights advocates um, have their sights set on Wilson and I think it's fair to say that the issue of women's votes fares well ultimately in that story, um, but we are still waiting for federal anti-lynching legislation even sitting here in 2020. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask two, I'm, I'm scanning um, to ask some Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna ask two more. Um, and actually they both have to do with current our current day um, issues. And um, do you feel that we are so divided as a country politically now because we are not able to see the um, commonalities in our struggles anymore? Has oppression become something that is fallen on deaf ears now? Pamela is asking that. What is your opinion on that, Martha? <sighs> Well, the first thing I know about this country is that it is so large and diverse and roiling that any general answer to your question, Pamela, would fall flat, right? That it's difficult to um, generalize about all Americans. And I think too many of us, um, on the one hand, recognize that when we are taken in the aggregate, we appear to be a profoundly divided nation um, that remains um, unable to see, um, to hear, to respond to, um, I'll speak specifically, um, to the history, to the past, but the presence of anti-Black racism. Um, and at the same time, I think 
one of the lessons that I take from the suffragists, and Ida Wells is a wonderful example. Ida Wells could not work on the national level with um, white suffragists. Um, they are they disrespect her, they exclude her, and they build a campaign for the vote that presumes that she won't get a vote. Um, women like her will not get a vote. At the same time, locally in Chicago, Wells works importantly and effectively with white suffragists, founds associations with them, campaigns for women's votes in Illinois with them. Um, and so I think one way to think about your question is about the scale of our activism and the scale of our public work. Um, and that for Wells, there were things she could accomplish in Chicago and in Illinois that she could not accomplish nationally but those things were meaningful and important and worth doing, um, even as they weren't um, everything. Uh, there's no question that we are at a moment of national reckoning, and I am a historian without any sort of capacity to prognosticate. Um, but I do think that in this, I follow the lead of someone like leader Stacey Abrams of Georgia, right, who says, um, there's too much work to do, right? There's too much work to do in front of us um, to um, rest on whether we are hopeful or we are discouraged. Um, where we are is in a moment about doing the good work, the important work that's in front of us. Um, that helps me to find my way um, and to set my sights um, despite the sorts of troubles that you point to. Thank you for answering that, Martha. You, I mean, what, what we're, we've been doing this whole time is we're looking back to the past to um, drive or to, ant, to help, um, help the narrative, the current narrative. So that's exactly why we're, you do what you do. I have one last question. I think it's going to be a, uh, maybe a little easier, I'm not sure, but certainly interesting. We can all relate to why wasn't the subject spoken of while Ryan is asking this question while Ryan was attending school in the late 1970s. I oh gosh, this as well. I was there with you, Ryan. Um, wasn't taught in my school either. Um, two short answers. One is that the very first history of women's suffrage, a six volume series, almost 6,000 pages, you can find it in your library or online today, the history of women's suffrage was written by women's suffrage activists, some of them, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony, who in what seemed like an exhaustive uh, treatment of the subject, really told only a slice of the story. Um, so our first and highly influential history of this movement was written by women who by and large did not um, tell the story that I tell in Vanguard. Their purpose was in part to valorize their own part of the movement and themselves. Fair enough. But as historians for a long time, we mistakenly regarded that as an exhaustive history. And we used it to then write histories that wrote textbooks and shaped museum exhibitions and a great deal more. Um, and so um, it's not until the 1970s and Maryland's own great um, historian, the late Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn at Morgan State University, who in her dissertation in the 1970s, rereads those six books, discerns what has been left out and begins to restore, for example, African-American women to the narrative. So I work very much in the tradition and I stand on the shoulders of Dr. Turborg Penn, um, who, um, not only courageously, but brilliantly challenge the orthodoxy. We've got a long way to go before this history makes it into, you know, K through 12 classrooms, but I spend a lot of time with K through 12 teachers, educators who are out there every day looking to teach the, um, the best and the newest, the cutting edge of what we know. Um, I'm part of a community of the Association of Black Women's Historians, and we're all doing that very same work. Forums like this, right, are, I hope there are educators among those of us who are tuned in today, um, organizations like ah, the Maryland 
History Center, <laughs> the Maryland Center for History and Culture. I got to get the name right. Um, that we look to our public institutions, mm -hmm. our public historians um, to help us in this work. And the anniversary has been a boon because folks are tuning in. So um, it doesn't happen as quickly or as uniformly as we would like. And I had to unlearn a whole lot myself in order to begin to write this book. Um, I hope it goes some distance. Um, I hope that Vanguard goes some distance to helping getting the story out there to many more Americans. Um, Martha, you were called a living library. <laughs> I don't know so, what that means. I I'm think that's a great... And old, but I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't a think that's how it was meant. <laughs> Well, I think that's a great place to end our discussion today. I thank you so much for the opportunity that we can host this conversation uh, with the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, and you allowed us to um, tap into your resources. resources. So thank you again. And um, everyone out there, thank you for joining us. Tune in next week. On November 5th, where we, we will be uh, transporting to Annapolis, the golden age of Annapolis, with our very own Mark Letzer, President and CEO of MCHC. But utilize our online resources um, with our new website as well. We have the Forgotten Fight, which is a virtual, our first ever virtual online exhibition about Maryland struggles, struggles, struggle with voting rights where it's highly interactive and you receive an, an id card through your process and your adventure and um through this virtual exhibition and it taps on many many of the issues that dr jones spoke on today so thank you again take care and join us next time bye-bye <laughs>